go. All right, Charles Hall received his PhD in systems ecology under Howard Would you like me to turn off with you? at the UNC no, in 1970. He was a professor at Cornell University, uh, University of Montana and SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. He's the author or editor of 14 books and 300 scholarly articles. He is best known for his development of the concept of EROI or energy returned on energy invested and by extension, a new field, biophysical economics. Uh, GDP, cash flow in the commercial economy, should not be used to guide public policy. Uh, scientists know it, sociologists know it, and the people, most importantly, the people who created the system of national accounts, which has evolved into the gross domestic product metric, knew it. They stated explicit, explicitly and emphatically that dollar-based national accounts should not be used as a basis for public policy formation or to gauge the health of the economy or society and, of course, environment. Uh, through his research, Charlie came to realize that energy was the base currency for all living organisms, which includes humans and our society. Uh, Consequently, he developed EROI to uh, illuminate the biophysical challenges which are lined up that we see now to the horizon. Uh, EROI is a critical national policy metric and the concept has been further extended to include the broad physical measurement of natural stocks and flows and humans interactions with them in the new field of biophysical economics. Uh, okay, Charlie, I'm turning it over to you and you can lead us through the world of uh, quantified biophysical consciousness that uh, perhaps began with the limits to growth. Charlie. Okay, thank you. I'm honored to join you. And uh, <clears throat> my, it's kind of curious that I find myself a bit of a spokesperson these days uh, for the limits to growth. Um, because I didn't start out to do this, I started out to be an ecologist, uh, but I will show you a little bit how it evolved into this direction. Um, okay, first, some history of the Yeah, Charlie, you muted yourself. Oh, I don't know how. Oh, and how about now? Now, 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 now. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. I'm, I'm quite honored. Um, it's kind of curious. I find myself as a spokesperson for limits to growth because I didn't start out uh, dealing with uh, ecology of all of human society, but rather the ecology of fish. But that's another thing. Here I am and we'll see how this evolved. First, I wanna give you some history of the limits to growth. When I was a graduate student and, um, and a postdoc, the major influences in my thinking were Howard Odom, my PhD advisor, who's known for systems ecology and many related things. Uh, and incidentally, we're the most incredible human being I've ever met uh, intellectually and otherwise. Uh, and M. King Hubbard, who probably most of you have heard about you know, the Hubbard curve of oil production, and Jay Forrester, who we're gonna be talking about his influences today. Jay Forrester was the inventor of what's called random access memory. We've got some example of that very early computer uh, memory in his hand. Um, and systems dynamics and the limits to growth um, when my father had gone to MIT, and when I came home at Christmas one year, there was this counterintuitive behavior social system which he gave to me that was published in Technology Review, the MIT alumni magazine. And that was an article by Jay Forrester, which just, I found astonishing. Um, and so that was the origin of the limits to growth. Uh, he gave his, uh, this project, he was very busy doing other things to uh, 
And Ella Meadows, who was a, at that time, a postdoc at Harvard, and his graduate students, Dennis Meadows, Gordon Randers, and William Burns. Um, and they generated with the financial and intellectual help of the Club of Rome, uh, this book, uh, The Limits to Grow, uh, which sold, I think, something like 30 million copies and uh, the most influential environmental book ever written and other things that are related to that. Um, and what basically they did was they made a model and the model was how an economy really works biophysically, not economically, but how it works in practice. It takes natural resources and uh, cheap labor around the world and generates our uh, goods and services and leaves behind environmental destruction and generates pollution. Uh, the unpleasant reality is this is how our economy works. Um, almost everything requires the destruction of nature uh, to and the pollution of nature uh, in order to meet the things that we find all nicely wrapped up in, in plastic and we uh, store us where we go and get them. So. Limits of growth is basically deals with the reality that our economy is a machine for taking natural resources from nature and turning it into uh, the goods and services uh, called consumer junk here uh, and generating pollution and CO2 emissions. It's, it's on, let's call a spade a spade. It's honestly what our economy does. And even though we get our, our food all nicely set out in trays in the, in the, grocery store and all of our consumer products all nicely packaged in, um, in our uh, stores, our big box stores, uh, fundamentally, they don't come from nowhere. They come from nature. And this was the essential uh, essence of the limits of growth, which is different from economic models. It doesn't mention any of that stuff, or barely does. Uh, just deals with prices and uh, money and stuff like that. So uh, I think the limits to growth for the first time called a, a spade a spade and said, this is what an economy is. And how long can we do this for? So they made a fairly simple model, originally designed by Jay Forrester. And they came up, um, looked at only a dozen uh, variables, I think five main, main ones, uh, resources, food per capita, population, industrial output per capita, and pollution, and <coughs> made um, various um, computer runs of this. This was back in the days of computer cards uh, that you put in trays into computers in the university uh, computer center, and um, it would generate these typed outputs. And this was output that was where we have all kinds of fancy colored outputs now. In many ways, this is simply came out in sheets of paper. Uh, and they, it was fairly clever for the time how they would have time series. Uh, in other words, the value of these things over time um, as a function of the operation of the model. And the thing was that the model would go through growth and then rather violent uh, changes. Um, and especially of interest was the human population would reach some level and decline. Uh, all of these things are relative. There are no units on the y-axis uh, or even the x-axis, except at either end. Um, so it was, you had to use a bit of imagination to 
understand what it is do was doing, although once you understood it, it was very clear. Now, the basic thing they found early in the game was that you could not get the computer to generate a stable environment, what we would call today a sustainable situation. They tried all kinds of things and it was almost impossible to get this model to give you what we would call sustainability today. And uh, they would double the resources, they would increase the technology, they would increase the efficiency, they would do all kinds of things, except they found they had to do two particular things. Um, and that was, they had to stabilize the human population, which at that time was about 3 billion people, seven and a half now, and they had to stabilize investments. They had to make investments only to the level of covering for depreciation. And that's something that I think is still the fundamental results of later versions or runs of the model. But this question of, first of all, stabilizing the human population, politically, you can't even talk about population now. Although the, the human population growth rate does seem to be declining some, but I think pretty soon it's gonna be 8 billion people. And also, uh, you know, the concept of stabilizing investments runs counter to every political platform that I know of on the planet. So um, this is what the model came up with. And if you didn't do these things, then one way or another, and I just reread the whole limits to growth, they do all kinds of attempts to stabilize the population using different procedures. And when you're all done, um, this is essentially the only way you can stabilize the model. Now, the oil prices came along in the 1970s. The book was published in 1972. The next year we had the first oil shock and the price of oil went up 42 times from 350 a barrel to 350 a gallon. Um, and many people, myself included, said, oh my gosh, something, the limits to growth is real and it's happening. Uh, there were huge previously unseen economic problems such as stagflation. And uh, the limits to growth model seemed to be validated by what was happening. Um, so this was very exciting to me at that time, even though I was working on fish, wasn't paying any attention to it. Um, but as soon as this came out, the mainstream economists did not like any of this at all. And they used three arguments. Uh, arguments from the logic of economics, which means uh, if you have a resource shortage, then uh, we'll use less of it and we'll, we'll find replacements, we'll find substitutes that will take care of the problem. Um, Paul Ehrlich made a stupid bet with Juliet Simon about the price of uh, a number of minerals. Uh, Paul Ehrlich lost the bet, although if he waited one more year, he would have won it. Um, and um, people thought that things were becoming cheaper because of technology um, and the price of oil receding. You know, most people look at the price of oil, that's how they generally look at whether things are going well or bad poorly. So many economists hated the limits of growth. They believed in technology that sparked of human ingenuity, et cetera. Something that's called the solo residual that if you look at the increase of GDP versus the increase in the um, labor and capital, which they view as the only 
factors of production, and there was this great solo residual uh, that they believed was human ingenuity. And they basically did not leave ask this question, are humans constrained by nature's laws and properties? And for me, as an ecologist um, that looked at how nature, all of nature is constrained by thermodynamics and availability of resources and so forth and so on, uh, I found the uh, autonomous argument specious. Uh, but it was just, you know, different toilet training. It's very fundamental to how you look at uh, these things. And by toilet training, I mean intellectual toilet training. And of course, I <laughs> kind of a different view of how we should be having intellectual toilet training in our students. And since I was a university professor most of my life, that's how I got them. Respected that they are actual realities and constraints in the natural world. Now, they said that the limits of growth did not refer to a single scientific study. That's incorrect, by the way. They said that it's a clear possibility that the development of nuclear fusion will open up a vast and previous and enormously cheap source of power. Well, uh, anybody getting their electricity from fusion today will agree with that. Um, and that's a question that perhaps we might explore in, in, um, in our questions, I don't know. Um, so they thought that the underlying assumptions of your fantasy, and certainly it is, if you're an economist. Uh, I like um, one economist quote is that anybody who believes in ex indefinite exponential growth on a finite planet is either a delusionist or an economist. So the economists didn't seem to believe that. And they say there were no inventions and output per unit input has been rising, which is not necessarily true. We can talk about that and so forth. Uh, here's one example, um, devastating critique and so forth and so on. And this was also published in the big piece in the New York Times. And so a lot of people thought that the limits to growth had been uh, debunked. Price of oil, uh, see in 1973 down there in the left-hand corner, and that's the price of oil went way up in the 1970s, the so-called oil crisis, following incidentally the peak of production of United States oil. Uh, and then it's been rattling around since then uh, at considerably less. Uh, this is uh, Paul Ehrlich, who you know, made this, I think, stupid bet, and I've discussed that elsewhere. So, uh, I mean, he's a very smart guy. Uh, now, another big thing um, was that uh, they didn't have ticks on their x-axis. So uh, when I came and started thinking about this around two, the year 2000 or 2005, I just did this. I, I, my big tools were a, a pen and a, a variable scale Xerox machine, which allowed you to do a lot of scaling of various things. And I looked at what they predicted and found that as of uh, 2008, I did this with John Day of uh, Louisiana State University, um, a good colleague. And I looked at these things and I said, John, you know, these, these things are still on track. But I think this is about right. And uh, so there was a big problem because you didn't have the technology or the limits to growth to put ticks on the axis, which you can see here I've done with the Friends. So, uh, so was the model wrong? I mean, that's a question we want to ask today. Uh, what's the present state of the limits to growth so-called predictions? Well, first of all, uh, they said in 1972, these are not expected to be specific predictions. 
graphs are not exact predictions of the variables. They are only indications of the system's behavioral tendencies. Very clearly said. Uh, but nevertheless, they, they have hardly been demonstrated incorrect, by like the contrary. And I ask, first of all, what economic model is still correct 50 years later? So 50 years later, uh, this is data that has been uh, done by Graham Turner and John Day and I also published something not quite as elegant, uh, asking the same question, looking at the predictions of the model, which are given in various dotted lines, in the empirical data since the production of the model, which is the heavier solid line, food, pollution, resources, and so forth, depending what resources you, you pick, and demographic, and so forth. And all of these, you can see that the model is doing right, right, well, not rather well, it's doing damn well. Um, uh, and it's um, a fairly good predictor so far. And of course, we're right at the cost of where things start to get very interesting. And so we don't know yet, but the model has not been demonstrated wrong, even if you don't talk about the fact that the model was not meant to be an explicit prediction. It does show you, though, that the model so far is not wrong. In the original um, work, people who did it were not trying to make exact annual predictions. And so the timing, you know, we have to give the model some flexibility in what does the, the timing of these changes mean. Okay, um, I'm gonna shift gears for a moment and talk about how I got involved in this and my personal Professional life has been devoted to trying to understand how energy works in natural systems and later in society. So originally I was just interested in water and ecology. And here's Howard Odom um, and just the most amazing intellect I've ever met. Um, and this was in the University of North Carolina, which I uh, I'm a northerner, but my mom was a southerner, and she told me that was a lovely place to go to school. And when I found out that Howard Odom was there, I, I quickly applied for graduate school, and that was the uh, best professional decision by far of my life. And I wanted to work in streams and water, and I found this lovely stream called Luho Creek in Duke Forest. And um, it's usually clear, and this is after a small flood. And here I am in about 1968 with my weir and traps. I, I blocked off the stream and made all the fish moving upstream or downstream. I uh, had to swim into my traps. And I became a great authority on using the pop rivet machine, and aluminum bars and hardware boss. And I did this for two and a half years measured practically every fish moving in Luho Creek. And at that time, the talk of fish was that they were territorial, but I found they had very strong migratory patterns and looked at this and uh, over, I measured 10,000 fish over the two and a half years migrating. So, uh, and sitting on this rock right here in the foreground, this big rock, I came up with this idea in the middle of the night of energy return on investment. That in nature, organisms invested energy uh, in swimming upstream, in the case of fish, to over seasonal patterns to exploit either for themselves or for their young to uh, get energy that was seasonally abundant at the upstream portions of the stream. And I came up with this idea of energy return on investment. It's the energy delivered to an organism or society over energy put into that activity, i.e. that was diverted from either the organism or from society. And uh, this has become a sort of, uh, it's really caught on now. I, I probably get a new paper 
uh, somebody sends me a new paper on EROI uh, almost every day, certainly a number per week, uh, somebody or another is, is doing something with energy return on investment. Well, anyway, at that time, I, uh, I spent years studying the migration of salmon in the Pacific Ocean. And uh, the idea was that you would have in, uh, so here's Seattle here, just to give you an idea, here's Alaska, British Columbia is in between. And there would be, due to physical conditions of the water column, there'd be a bloom of phytoplankton in the spring, little plants, and followed by a bloom of zooplankton, which is the food for the little salmon. And they'd come out of the rivers, like the Fraser River, at just the right time to nail the zooplankton. And then this bloom would move up and along the coast and up to Alaska, so to be up in Alaska in the summer, and the fish would follow this bloom, in this case, sockeye salmon, going northward um, and investing energy in following that bloom. And then they, they cycle, annual cycle around this, uh, this, the North Pacific Ocean until they were ready to spawn. And then they'd come back into their natal rivers to spawn all of which was fascinating to me. And um, you can tell that the investment of this enormous amount of energy in this migration has a positive energy return on investment. So here are some salmon, a picture I took up in Northern British Columbia. And these are big sockeye salmon. Uh, they're about 10 pounds and um, they're, waiting to mature to spawn. Um, and then you can see in the foreground, these little fellas. Now, these are the brothers and sisters of these big sand. They're the same age. They may be an exact sister, but they didn't migrate. So it's clear that the process of migration returned far more energy than it costs to do the migration because the salmon are much bigger and they have 3,000 eggs instead of 800 eggs. And so through straightforward Darwinian processes, there was a, a positive evolutionary return from this migration. So I was working on those issues mostly as an ecologist, but Howard Odom was just beginning to write on the, on how energy was used in society um, and wrote a book called Environment, Power, and Society that was very popular. And, um, and he certainly began teaching his graduate students on the importance of fossil energy. We never thought about fossil fuel before that, particularly you just, you know, we expect gasoline to be at the gas pump. Um, and it's amazing how we do so much in our universities teaching on the environment and so little on the resources that we totally depended upon, the food and, uh, for example, so, you know, it takes about uh, 10 joules of energy, of fossil energy to produce and process and distribute and cook each of the calories of food that we, each of the joules of food that we eat. Um, so how many people know that? While they're saying all the bad things about the oil companies, well, let's say a few good things too. Now they're both true. Uh, now, just to give you an example of how important the petroleum is to our society, this is a 30 horsepower harvest. So you've got 30 horses and probably mules here, five guys running it. So that's about six horsepower per human. Uh, and then you've got, uh, you've got to grow the feed for the uh, mules that you need stable boys, you need to harness them every morning, you have to do all those things. Now, by contrast, here is 200 horsepower harvesting. So that's 200 versus six horsepower per person, meaning 
you can do uh, whatever that is, 30 odd times more work. One person uh, can do 30 times more work per hour. That, that's where labor productivity comes from, right? By providing energy to help to give the worker bigger muscles so they can do bigger, can do more work. And if you look at the growth of our global economy, which is the dotted line, and you find it almost, uh, almost the same line as our increase in our use of energy, in this case, coal, oil, gas, uh, nuclear, natural gas, uh, I'm sorry, hydropower, which remains the largest um, source of uh, renewable energy solar energy. And then this little small line on the top, which is maybe just a little bit bigger now, which is what comes from uh, wind turbines, uh, photovoltaics. So. so how do you get wealthy? You use more energy, as long as you got it. Now we applied these ideas from fishery uh, to petroleum. So this, this paper back in 1981, uh, I did with my uh, great undergraduate student, Tyler Cleveland, who's a professor at Boston University now, <clears throat> still working on some of these things. And uh, we found two things that uh, the energy return on energy investment was declining, and that the harder you look for oil in any one year, the less efficiently you found it. So, uh, you know, economic models that say, well, you're going to spend more money to go get more oil. Well, you don't necessarily get more oil. You might just get the oil you get less efficient. Then we went, we got lots of papers into the so-called best journals. Uh, here's one energy in the U.S. economy, a biophysical perspective. This is sort of the beginning of biophysical economics. I guess although certainly other there were precedents by Howard Oden and others uh, to just go right in and so, um, so that, that was the cover paper issue of science. And the, an ironical note is that I may be the only Ivy League professor to be denied tenure on the week I got the cover issue of science, which is you know, the, sort of the best thing you can get uh, as, a, as an academic, but uh, I guess it didn't matter. Some people didn't like what I was saying, I guess. Um, now, in the back to the limits to growth, energy was not considered explicitly in limits to growth. I've been, I've been communicating with Dennis Meadows in the last few weeks as I prepare for this and for a paper I'm writing on this. Um, and so he told me that resources, which in my mind, energy, because that's how I think. But in the, they hadn't thought about energy at all. The resources, the, the only examples they give are a few minerals uh, in the book. And um, it's just meant to be resources in general. And so I'm going to now, what I'm going to do now is look explicitly at what energy might mean for limits to growth today. And the first thing is that energy is a universal resource. If you have enough energy, you can generate essentially any other resource. I, I can mine copper from my backyard if I want, or probably most any other element, not much of it. But if I have enough energy to grind up the whole backyard, I can get a, a, a gram of, of something, just about anything from the backyard. So first of all, energy is a universal resource in a sense, and it's a two-edged sword. You know, we all understand the other edge of the pollutants and so forth. Second thing that people don't understand very well is it causes dependency. Once you start using fossil energy, it works. Very, very hard to get off. Uh, and we'll look at some implications of that. Third is it's finite, and both supplies and quality. And then quality, we use the idea of energy return on investment. So what kind of future do I envision? Well, I'm asked this a lot of times. And I have to say that my inbox is, you know, almost every day I get some 
gloom and doom, environmental or other, you know, how our horrible future awaits us, and certainly for many other species, that's a, a great concern to me. Okay. And also, uh, I often get some kind of uh, perspective of we're going to be able to um, get around this. There's some new magic technology that's going to somehow solve all these problems. So I get them both. And so I don't know. Now, I, we, we thought way back when that we would have um, serious problems by now, the model indicated and so forth. But they haven't particularly happened, certainly not here in Montana. And uh, so I, first of all, I want, I want to say with this humility that what's the future going to bring? But I think I know some things. And we face, in my mind, six basic problems that must be overcome if we are to successfully navigate the future. And by the future, I mean the near to medium term. Uh, and I will show you what that means, but let's just say the next 50 years or even in five years. First is climate change, and I, I'm not going to discuss that everybody else does, except to make the point that what's the most great, important greenhouse gas? So write that down in front of you. What's the most important greenhouse gas? Probably most of you have done CO2 or methane, but no, the most important greenhouse gas is water. A lot of people don't know that and we don't really know what's going on with water. Now, the, the exception of climate change, these six basic problems that I'm talking about is basically not considered by the sustainability community. So one of the big problems I have is there's almost nobody talking about what I consider to be the most important sustainability issues. So, one of which is the depletion of our basic fossil fuels. Fossil means simply old. Fossil fuels, oil, gas, coal are the basic of our modern economies. 80% of our energy input and in all of our economic activity is essentially one for one, um, synonymous with energy. A, a dollar bill is a, a lean on, on energy. So, if you society will pay you the work of about half a coffee cup's worth of oil, um, if you uh, if you spend this dollar, and it's the basis of our uh, economies, wealth, food supply, health, education, and so on. And uh, this is my view of things that I think that depletion of our fossil fuels this is a much bigger problem than CO2, but nobody talks about it. Um, so there you go. that's one of the issues we have to deal with. Uh, and again, given the importance of the use and growth of fossil fuel relative to the development of welfare, what does this mean for our future? Uh, now, depletion is easy to grasp. As every beer drinker knows, glass starts full and ends empty. The quicker you drink it, the sooner it is gone. So, you know, everything we're doing in our political system is to try to get you to drink the beer quicker, to, to grow the economy. <laughs> Same principle applies to oil and gas. And how has this reality been conceived? It's a devastating realization. Right? Now, I've done a lot of work on this, with, especially with my student, John Halleck. <clears throat> we, I did this initially in Fortran. He did it with spreadsheet and was maintaining the data. So uh, we could update this data uh, and it would show you more of the same. But fundamentally, what it shows here, uh, some 36 out of 40 odd uh, oil producing countries show very clear what are called Hubbard curves. Let's just look at the Hubbard curve is this, is this uh, 
bell-shaped curve, a sort of a normal curve. Um, and we published this first in 2004 uh, in the Journal Energies. And uh, we made projections of how much oil Yemen, a moderate oil producing country might make given low, that's the purple middle, the blue dotted, and green, uh, the uh, high estimates as provided by the United States Geological Survey for every country in the world, then we would mathematically generate a uh, hover curve for the future. And we did this back where the vertical line is. And we found that for essentially every oil producing country, um, except the very largest, they followed, i.e. the Middle East, they followed one or another of these curves. And with the peak, this is called peak oil. And peak oil has in fact occurred for the majority of oil producing countries, very clean, beautiful data. Even for conventional oil in the United States, which had a peak back in 1972. Now, unconventional oil, it's a different issue. And we'll talk about that briefly. And it applies only to the United States and conceivably a little bit to Argentina uh, and maybe China. Who knows what's going on there? But for most countries, you see this very clear prediction. And we've had now. Um, peak oil for six of eight continents. Uh, and you can see in this graph here, uh, this is shale oil, that's unconventional oil. Uh, and so that's something different. And this is the Middle East. Now this, this is for all liquids, which includes natural gas liquids, uh, uh, biofuels like corn-based ethanol and so forth. And that, uh, that's still increasing, but conventional oil for the world as a whole peaked in around 2005 and has been bumping along since then. And we've got a bit of a boost, but for most continents, peak oil is a reality. Peak oil isn't a myth, depends where you look. And uh, this is world uh, production oil done by Gail Kerber, who does, thinks a lot about these things. <clears throat> at least the rates of increase have declined quite dramatically. Now, how much oil will there be in the future? Well, these are hovered, hovered curves for all fossil fuels, including the real crappy stuff. Well, you know, your Canadian pipe sands and all of that kind of stuff. All of these are included. And this is a low estimate, a middle estimate, and a high estimate. And so, uh, I just put down the low estimate, in my view, probably closest to reality, but who knows. Uh, and this is, uh, speaking to students, this is when a student today will die. I mean, we're going to see this, presumably. Now, old guys like us, I don't know, I'm going to die pretty soon, but uh, young people are certainly going to have to deal with it. Who's talking about it? Nobody. Now, this is their medium estimate. And so the, here's where you, the young people today are going to die. And if it's got, this is the high estimate, and even with the high estimate, in all the different fossil fuels in the world, um, this implies you're going to see it. Remember, this is what our economies are based on. Okay, same is true for all of our minerals. The average grade of all these different uh, mineral supplies um, has been going down, which means that there's more energy that is being used per kilogram of pure metal delivered. Uh, and I just found a good paper from some people, a lot of good work going on now in Spain. Some people in Spain, um, I can't remember at the moment, uh, on this now. Uh, and what we do, what people do is they just go through exploitation cycles, certainly in Canada. But this happens to be Ecuador, which doesn't show up. At the top. Oh, yeah, there it is. And, uh, you know, this, these are different resources, crawled shrimp, pelagic fish, bananas, uh, shrimp from their ponds, coffee, and now they're on their last big resource exploitation cycle, which is oil. 
uh, which has re reached peak oil in the last few years. And where do they go from now? So we just go through these exploitation cycles, which is consistent with what the limits to growth model said, that we exploit resources over time. All of this is what that model was showing us back in 1972. Now, the third, I'm not gonna talk much about it here, is the declining ROI of our most important fuels. So this is for the United States. These uh, dots are three different studies. We had a peak uh, of around 30 to one back in 1970, and we're down to around 10 to one today. Um, and this is for Norway. And this is for Mexico. And oh no, this is for all uh, private companies. There, all the indications we have are that in recent decades, the energy return on investment for oil has been declining because we've used up the best stuff. You know, that's that's what uh, in in uh, economics Ricardo was talking about. You know, it's, it's not like it's a secret. People don't talk about. Uh, here's one, uh, EROI for global oil and gas, and no one on myself. And the thing is, we need not just a positive EROI, we need a high EROI to have anything like civilization. So we, we tried to figure this out once. So if you have an EROI of 1.1 to 1, you can extract oil and look at it. You want to refine it, you want to have a 1.2 to 1 and so forth. And these are increasingly speculative, but you need high ROIs if you have anything like modern civilization. And uh, Jessica Lambert, my, my colleague, will be talking about that next week. So about a lot. Uh, and the situation perhaps that's summarized in the cheese slicer model. And if you think of the economy as generating uh, green cheese here, <laughs> the GDP. Basically, except for exports and imports, uh, you take your GDP and use it for consumption or investments. And the consumption goes into staples or discretionary or the movement. And likewise, investments. Investments is energy to go into getting energy or infrastructure maintenance. You got to do that. Your bridges or your bridges fall down. And then there's discretionary. Let's build a new movie theater, whatever. So this is 1949. And I did this as Bobby Powers and Billy Shungle. And I'll just go through here quickly from 70. Things aren't changing too much, but you notice from 70, just look at this discretionary arrow up here to 1981, when the price of oil went way up, you had to invest in a lot more into getting energy in your discretionary decrease. But then things pretty much settled down and on we go. But if we project in the future a decline in energy return on investment, you've got to take more and more of the output of your economy and put it into getting the energy to run it. And uh, this implies <laughs> discretionary spending is going to be a lot less in the future. But that means on the And most importantly, if uh, this guy and his colleagues, Kaplan Perez, um, in Spain has been doing a beautiful, beautiful analysis of what would happen if we went to 100% solar, meaning from wind turbines or PVs, uh, or 75% or 50%, what the energy return on investment of the whole world economy would do, and, and it would decline. So because the energy return on investment, because the Renewable systems require such huge investments up front. Most of them don't deliver a high amount compared to uh, what it costs you to make them. And you have to do all the investments soon, then, then your EROI would decline down to probably what's not enough to maintain civilization as we know it. Uh, and you know, you have to do your homework. So it's all this talk about electric cars. But, you know, we only make about 10% at most of our electricity from uh, you know, so 
solar energy, which incidentally requires an enormous amount of materials. And so we'd have to make most of the electricity for our, our uh, electric cars from fossil fuel. And they require 80 kilograms of copper compared to 21 for an internal combustion car, et cetera, et cetera. So all kinds of things that you know, people have been greenwashed. Uh, we have to talk about population, water and soil, resources per capita, and we can't talk about any of these things. Uh, the fourth is Jevons Bear Paradox. The most common response to the issues of limits to growth is technology. We do some better technology. Often this means an increase in efficiency, but as Stanley Jevons founded back in uh, 1850, when in Europe, England to save coal, they made more efficient steam engines to, to save coal. They became cheaper and more uses were found for the rate of, and the rate use of coal increased. And we see this everywhere. You, you make refrigerators uh, more efficient, people get bigger ones. And make lights, uh, maybe the LED is an exception, I don't know, but we make lights cheaper, people use them more, et cetera. And uh, efficiency is the basic mantra of the modern green movement. Uh, and there's on the bottom, uh, so we greatly increase the efficiency of airplanes with people using 10 times more. That's Jevons paradox. So efficiency by itself is not a solution to these problems. The fifth, and I can hardly, that's another, <laughs> Two semesters lecture. The, the suite, of, the big fifth problem we have to solve is the suite of myth, myths, usually called conventional or neoclassical economics. And basically, the neoclassical economics is that you know, myself and many others have written it's based on it's unrealistic. It's based on a set of premises that break the basic laws of thermodynamics, conservation of matter, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, their models cannot exist in the real world. The neoclassical economics is money little importance because the price is low. But that's why energy is important to the economy because it's so cheap. For the, you get so much bang for the buck. And add an energy to your production function and the solo residual, i.e. all the effects of technology disappears. So most technology so far has been throwing more energy Okay, so most of our economic and financial theories have arrived here. And we're, here we are bouncing around. This is our global fossil fuel cycle. What are economic theories you appropriate here? Well, we don't have any idea. We're not working on it. We don't think about it. Uh, there is uh, an alternative, biophysical economics. We have an international society of biophysical economics, right? You want to join it. We have a journal. Uh, we have a textbook um, and a new think tank I'm very excited about. So, all of these things, if you're interested, you can find out a lot. You can just email me, chall at esf.edu. Okay, the sixth, and I'm almost done, is the most difficult and most important social response. And if, if we have to take more and more of the output of our GDP and invest it in getting enough energy to keep the machine running, that's gonna decrease the amount available for discretionary spending. People are gonna go nuts. That, that was a series of slides I showed. And presumably as EROI declines either from depletion or because we're going to um, renewable energy that's going to be less available for consumption, it's likely to be large scale. And we've seen in, in Tehran, in, in, in Caracas, and in Paris, everywhere where the energy becomes less available. Then you have riots, big riots, when they have to increase the price of gasoline or buses or whatever. Um, so how are we going to deal with this with an increasing 
world population of Boston hungry people. And the person who's written about it, I think, is uh, Nafiz Ahmed. And this is a wonderful book. Everybody should read this book. Uh, and so the limits to growth, I believe, is playing out not for the world as a whole, not for the rich countries yet, anyway, but nation by nation. So he finds that when you have, like in Egypt or Syria, Venezuela, when you have peak oil, and everybody has become, as he said, more and more hooked, more and more dependent upon the oil, and then you have peak oil in a decline, then you get extreme social unrest. And he analyzes the And good biophysical economics can explain many things. I wrote a paper on how uh, Trump's supposed economic success was due to fracking. The energy was half the price in the US during the Trump years as it was from the Obama years or as it was in Europe. And so cheap, cheap energy, guess what? Makes your economy strong. And he was the, <laughs> all this fracked oil incidentally was based on the investors losing their shirts. Nobody made any money on the fracking. It was a dollar sink of energy source in a way. So, okay, so I think the limits to growth model asks the right questions. And no newer approach it asks them any better. It's absolutely brilliant. And his track record so far is good. Uh, but here's some further thoughts on limits to growth. Uh, Dennis Meadows said in the 30 year update they had. Uh, that we had lost 30 years by doing nothing. Now we lost 50. We've done nothing about the limits of growth. We have not examined today their conclusions. We need to stabilize population and stop investments to generate stability. Now I'm running for president on that platform. You didn't get anybody going to vote for me. Heck, what technology is there that does not need the Jevons paradox? Nearly all green solutions that are offered. In Look at them all the time, and I don't find them green. Uh, for example, Green Sakara, June Sakara <clears throat> found that essentially all industrial removals <clears throat> of CO2 from either smokestacks or from the atmosphere generated more CO2 from the process than they removed from the stacks or from the atmosphere. Um, she, she did examine 200 case histories. Um, the governmental uh, data and institutions, uh, I think of, uh, well, the statistical units in the United States, uh, Bureau of, um, senior moment, but anyway, they're not maintaining the data. Um, they, they leave it to the market instead of getting good data to understand things. This, this is a terrible thing to do. Science is used increasingly to defend positions rather than test hypotheses. And I might say, if we're going to go into this restricted future, restricted energy future, this is a great time to think about redistribution. When I was a kid delivering papers in the fourth grade, and I read in the Boston Globe that, that wealthy people paid 90% of their income uh, above a certain amount uh, certain, on in taxes. And, you know, regular people pay 30%. I think, well, that makes sense to me. Well, you know, now the wealthy pay less as a percentage than I do. That's crazy. It's just crazy. We just sold off all of our national mortality, mora morality to people who fund our politicians. That's another thing. Well, so what, is this where we are? Is this what's gonna happen? Uh, you know, you can look at the, the history of mankind and in 1930, we have this big pulse of fossil fuel and now maybe we're not gonna have this in the future. And so <laughs> here we have a caveman coming along and then we have all the modern land floating in space. And then what's it gonna be like into the future? Is it, just going to be another human, and what does he gain from all this? Let me you see. You notice he's got a bow and arrow. That's going to be the next future. But I don't have a clue. And my computer is stopped.
Hello. There we go. Well, there you go. Uh, it depends on how nature is so indifferent to us. Well, it is. Nature's going to do what it's going to do. It's going to follow the laws of physics, laws of thermodynamics, not what you want. And if you do not have enough energy, no other sustainable issues matter. It just amazes me what's put forth as sustainable. It, it mostly doesn't think a thing about energy and often is energy intense. Crazy stuff. Every day. Well, there you go. I have it. Uh, you can read that. Well, the picture's pretty bleak, gentlemen. The world's climates are changing. Mammals are taking over and all. We all have a brain about the size of walnuts. Might apply to our species too, I don't know. So here's my final professional goal. Um, and um, that's it. I will take questions. Yeah, great, uh, Charlie, thanks very much. Uh, that's, uh, that's a wonderful overview. And uh, uh, we don't have many questions now, but I hope people get scribbling. I have a question uh, as uh, sponsors write. I, I also wanted to make the point that that book by uh, uh, Nafiz Ahmed, uh, Ahmed, really that you mentioned, really just captures the whole impact of, of your entire presentation, the, the social impact compressed into about 30 or 40 years uh, is just uh, wonderful. Uh, and uh, I, I think it, uh, it's uh, very easy to get through, very well laid out, uh, informs us about the chaos that's happening we read about daily, uh, but deals with the fundamental causes of it. So I, I think it's a fabulous book. But Charlie, I, I wanted to ask you, the, uh, uh, when I looked at this, uh, you have a, uh, the, the EROI pyramid, uh, various levels of, uh, uh, I guess, sophistication for society based on the availability of energy. Uh, but I, I think that changes, does it not uh, geographically? Say uh, someone uh, living on Baffin Island requires an immensely uh, uh, greater uh, energy budget than someone living in Guadalajara. Not if you're an Inuit. <laughs> well, no, it's to, to live at a certain, at the level of sophistication. Uh, oh, okay. yeah, well. Like 50,000, 50, if you have 50, uh, a daily per capita energy budget of 50 kilowatts in uh, the far north, you're probably dead. Uh, if you have an energy budget of 50 kilowatt uh, hours in Guadalajara, you're probably rich. Uh, you can live extremely well because the demand uh, for both resources and raw energy is far lower in some regions than it is in other regions. And that's just one variable I wanted to throw at you. Uh, have you looked at that? Uh, uh, not explicitly, um, but uh, we use sort of average conditions in the United States. So in the Southern United States, uh, you don't have to use as much energy for, for heating, but you have to use a lot more air conditioning. Therefore, you don't have to, but we do today. Okay. And um, so, uh, and, but the energy to make the food is probably about the same. Uh, and the energy used in transportation is probably about the same. So um, I don't, uh, well, we have somebody from Guadalajara. I, mean, I can tell you, I visited Guadalajara, and it's a fairly energy-intensive city. Okay. And uh, so, uh, hey, Charlie, can I say something? Yeah, this, this John, this John Day, my uh, very close colleague. I uh, I messed up on my time zones. Uh, with regard to that, Robbie Berger and I, and Jim Brown, and some few other people published a paper a couple of years ago. If you go from uh, you know, countries that are very rural and have uh, GDP energy consumption, maybe at 500 watts, you know, five times the basic level of your, your metabolism. If you take that up to the highly developed uh, countries that 
that are rich. The energy consumption, GDP energy consumption, energy uh, GDP energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions go up by two to three orders of magnitude. So if you're living in Guadalajara, uh, you know, like a caveman or something, that's one thing. But all of us, and, and the way we live, we use energy that's like two orders of magnitude times higher than the poor, poorest people on earth. So uh, it doesn't really make any difference whether you're living way up north or in the tropics. You're using an enormous amount of energy if you're living like we do. You want to look at the most environmental, environmentally virtuous people in your neighborhood, look at the homeless. Because they yeah, use well, uh, they're, they're much poor. less energy now. Okay. I, I don't think, I think we should have uh, uh, homes and, and uh, a good diet for these people. I think we should use energy, but use it wisely. Uh, but the problem is there's so many people in the world who want to live a high lifestyle. And then, you know, there are this upper 1% that use such enormous resources. Uh, I, I don't know. Okay. But okay. certainly your level of affluence is probably your main determinant. Uh, as Paul Ehrlich said long ago, that um, your impact, your environmental impact, and this could be fuel use, is equal to the population times per capita affluence times the technology factor. And, and our governments won't allow the discussion of population anymore. When do you hear population? So, a little okay. bit of noise about borders. And um, when you hear any discussion of what level of affluence we should have, except more, uh, you don't. So there's almost no possibility of discussing this in the political arena. Right? Okay, fair enough. We've got questions here. Uh, Peter uh, uh, Bulkowski uh, is first, if you can turn on your mic. Uh, Robert Hoffman is on deck. Uh, if you could turn on your mic, uh, Peter, uh, can you uh, pose your question? Can you put the picture of the person asking the question? Any way to put that up next to me? Yeah, they have to activate. Yeah, Char Charles, my name is Peter Blakowski. Uh, I can't activate uh, a camera. I don't have one that works with my computer. Uh, okay. I, I, I'm a, a chemist. Uh, three degrees in chemistry uh, and over 40 years working oil and gas. What you say about energy being sent the, the central uh, component of our industrial society is absolutely correct. And there would be almost nobody in the oil and gas business who would have disagreed with that at any time over the 40 years that I've worked there. You've identified a bunch of problems, many of which uh, those of us who work in oil and gas have seen and understand. What solutions do you have? You're saying we can't discuss these things. Politics won't let us discuss a bunch of them. But where, where, where do we go? Are we just going to let it run? First of all, I, I don't have any magic solution. Uh, you know, maybe we'll invent fusion. You know, I've been waiting for fusion since 1970. But, uh, there are some people who think we're going to do that, but if you have unlimited clean energy, then you're going to have all kinds of other problems because that will allow this whole juggernaut to continue. Um, so uh, maybe that would be better. No, I don't have any magic solutions. I think we've got to go to photovoltaics and windmills, and it will be very, very expensive and socially disruptive to do that. But I don't think we have a chance. A chance, and we probably got to do our best to limit greenhouse emissions, um, maybe. And um, so, I uh, the thing that's bothering me is we're not even talking about it. We're not even talking about the end of cheap oil, which has got to be with us uh, in much less than a generation probably before I die, I'm 77. So it's not gonna to be too long till then, and I might see it. So uh, certainly the younger people are gonna see it and they're gonna to have to deal with it and say, what the hell are you doing? Why were you fiddling while Rome was 
burning when you had these obvious things. Why, why weren't you even discussing it? Why didn't I learn anything about that at university? Why are we teaching about depletion in universities? Not me. I don't think it happens in my university since I retired or John's either. And certainly it's happening when we were teaching. But. So, um, and, and all these people are given all of these senses that technology somehow is going to solve the problem. And, well, you know, to some extent, technology makes a difference. I have to say that uh, our oil and gas predictions were wrong in the sense that we didn't see uh, fracking. Coming. Well, is fracking making a difference? A little. Is it making a difference on the world? Very little. Will it be important in 50 years when we need it? How much are you going to be willing to pay for oil? And uh, so um, it, there's a, a discussion as to how we need oil not more expensive than $80 a barrel to run our economy, but we need at least 50 or 60 or $70 a barrel to get it from uh, these poor quality uh, fracked resources. So um, I don't know, Gail Turberg has written a lot about this. Is, is there some kind of, you know, Goldilocks perfect price of oil that will see us for another 20 or 30 years. Well, I'm not going to see us beyond 20 or 30 years and probably not even beyond 10. But, okay. you know, we've been saying that for a long time. And it hasn't happened yet. So I got to be careful about anything resembling a prediction. <laughs> okay. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Rob, uh, Rob Hoffman is up next and then Art Hunter. Rob. Okay. Thanks, uh, John. Uh, uh, Charlie, it's good to meet you. I've been following your work uh, in the biophysical economics uh, community for <laughs> almost as long as I can remember. I recognize um, your name. Uh, I guess I read the Limits to Growth uh, uh, book uh, not long after it was published, and it became very much influential in in the work that I do. And I guess I can mention as an aside that I've been involved in systems modeling hmm, uh, for the last 30 or 40 years at, uh, at least. Um, and the limits to growth uh, uh, added the, the dimension of, of real dynamics modeling uh, that complemented the work that I had been doing in input output analysis, which is essentially comparative statics. Uh, and I guess I've been a lot of my career combining those two, uh, two notions. Um, I thought the limits to growth was brilliant, uh, but now 50 years later, uh, I'm a bit disturbed that uh, the World 3 model remains relatively unchanged and I don't see any good successors around. Um, there are two things uh, about it uh, that I think need to be addressed. The first is, uh, as you've already mentioned, it didn't deal with explicitly with energy. And it treated then uh, our planet, the Earth system as a closed system when the Earth system is open to energy from the sun. And that changes everything, of course. Um, uh, uh, the other element about it that disturbs me is that human behavior is implicit in the feedback loops in the model. Uh, and that human behavior is caught in parameters that are not time dependent. Uh, so fundamentally human beings as they're represented in the model cannot learn and adapt. Uh, and as we know, any living system that can't learn and adapt uh, is bound to collapse. And so it should not have been surprising uh, that the World 3 model was all about various kinds of collapse. Um, that's my comment. Uh, and I would ask you uh, 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 to respond, if you would, please. 
Well, Dennis, I think would say that why is that a problem? Because human behavior in that, at least he said in the 30 year uh, review, human behavior has not changed. He saw no response of human behavior so far. And I say 20 years later, I see no, no response of human behavior. I mean, we talk a lot about sustainability, but um, most of it is uh, very close to it. And uh, I will, I have, you've made a lot of points and I want to reply to your report. I think these people in Spain, uh, Kaplan Perez uh, and his colleagues, uh, and I come across several others, uh, have attempted to put in um, energy itself and explicitly the transition from fossil energy to renewable energy. Um, and they've tried to model it and, and I showed what I think their most important results, which indicates it's pretty bloody hard to uh, make this transition because your energy is gonna require so much energy to do it. Um, and that would imply if we were able to have successful nuclear or fusion whatever, also you have to study it. Um, so I'd say one human behavior hasn't changed. So there's no need to put that into the model, although you could. Uh, number two, they have made similar models, um, very few and not exactly the same. Uh, and I give you uh, Perez, um, uh, Capilano present, uh, Perez's model as one, and I could probably come up with three or four examples of people who are trying to do it. Um, and incidentally, we'd like to do this in our new biophysical economics institute. Uh, so um, we might go there, and anybody wants to fund that project, we might guess. And um, the what was the third point you made? That's my response to two of your points. <laughs> what was the point number two? Uh... I, I think, I don't think there was another point uh, okay. beyond that. Uh, uh, the only thing that I would, would say is that uh, in the concept of human behavior, uh, uh, in some sense is an accumulation of knowledge. Uh, and in that sense, human behavior has changed an awful lot. Uh, We're having and, fewer children. And, 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 and the world three model, uh, does not have any explicit representation of the technology we have, let alone the, the, the technology that we know about that might be, but it certainly can't have any representation of the, te of the technology that has yet to be invented. That's Boulding's theorem. Uh, uh, well, and, so and, and, and in some sense then, uh, uh, the future is quite uh, unpredictable because we can't predict what we're going to learn. And so you have to think of modeling as not being a Newtonian device, uh, but as being an, uh, an adjunct, if you like, uh, to the human capacity to perceive and understand. I, I'd like to take the issue of human behavior. Uh, the largest change in human behavior that has made a difference in this, I think, is the population birth rate and the human, and that has declined, and that has declined almost exactly as was predicted back in 1970 by the model. So they, they made a prediction of what humans would do into the future, which is in fact, almost exactly what humans have done. So the human behavior has changed according to 
what they said in that model. Now, as I said in my talk, the most common uh, response is that some technology is going to change this. And although I treated it very lightly, the most important technological changes that have occurred in the past have been throwing more energy at the problem and agriculture is an example and so forth. So um, we, we would have to talk about a game-changing technology. Now, the two game-changing technologies that I have discussed are, um, are fracking, which gave us more oil uh, for sure, but not a lot more oil, and then really changed the, the projection into the future. So, but that's one, and it's true, and it's work. Second is nuclear. Well, where's that going? You know, how, where's fusion going? Are we, I have a friend who predicts that, uh, that there will be uh, commercial fusion in a decade or less. Um, but done by private industry. I mean, I can hardly believe that. But, but you know, it's a possibility. Um, other than fusion, what's a technology? And we can talk about efficiency, but I talked about efficiency. Then you got to make sure you somehow deal with Devon's paradox, which we don't do. We have not done yet. And so you have to tell me how human behavior is going to change in ways that it hasn't been changing that would make a difference to the ultimate results of the limits to growth. And my answer to you is, I think it's quite possible, but I, I don't know what it is. Okay, uh, Charlie, uh, we've got a bunch of questions here. Yeah, uh, go. Uh, so could the questioners uh, keep their comments uh, fairly concise? Uh, and Art, uh, up and... Uh, Rigo, uh, you're on deck. Could you activate your mic, please? Okay, um, Charlie, thank, thanks for uh, your, your presentation. I'm, I'm gonna talk about future energy sources and particularly <coughs> geothermal. You know, this is the center of the earth has the same temperature as the surface of the sun. And we have not tapped into that as a species. It, um, uh, as you may or may not know, I have been running uh, my residence for, for four years and tapping into geothermal uh, just by going down into a trench that's eight foot deep. And that, that gives me all the, the energy I need to heat and cool my house. So uh, have you uh, thought at all about uh, geothermal and uh, uh, how, what do you see in its future and, and mankind taking advantage of it? Marginal energy source in this way, what we're doing with geothermal is taking our highest quality energy, which is electricity, and using that to gain roughly four units of thermal energy. Um, so in a certain sense, we normally take three or four units of thermal energy, uh, coal or oil and gas, and burn it in an electricity plant and make one unit of electricity. Uh, and we're willing to do it because the electricity is of higher quality. So what you're doing is doing the inverse. In, in a sense, sure, it works, and, but it's, you're trading high quality energy for low quality energy. So it's four times better, I suppose, than uh, resistance heating, and that's fine. Uh, but I don't think you're going to run Canada on this. Um, <laughs> uh, just let know. me comment. I, I I get my electricity from solar, so in fact, I'm I'm uh, not really adding. Well, who built your solar panels, and out of what? How much coal? Well, in, in, good point. And so, you know, we've done, Pedro Prieto and I have done an analysis uh, for solar power in Spain back in, uh, you know, 20 years ago. And, and you got back, when we were all done, you got back only about three units of energy for every unit that you put in. And all these people who give you higher EROI, 10 to 1 and so forth, are weighting the value of the electricity versus the 
thermal input. And this doesn't include how much you have to pay for storing uh, additional electrical wires, all kinds of things that are related to and are not dealt with yet at a, if you have large penetration. You can have a little solar energy and, and you can deal with it, but because it's so, it goes from full tilt, tilt that will melt transistors in California and does in California electrical systems to zero in six hours later. And what do they do in California? They have to import dirty energy made with dirty oil from Mexico to make it look like they're being green in California. Uh, and, and we, I can go into much more detail in these things. And solar makes a certain amount of sense. And as I said, I'm all for it. I think we've got to go in that direction. But there's an awful lot about it that's really subsidized and hidden. Does the government subsidize either your PV or your uh, thermal, the ground energy uh, production? Thank okay. you. Yeah, Charlie, good. Uh, Rigo, you're up. And Bill Reeves, you're on deck. If you could turn on your mic, please. Hi, Charlie. Uh, how are you? Hi, uh, nice, nice to see you. I, 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 I love your talk uh, again, as always. Um, I just want, well, recently, uh, you know, I'm here in Vermont and we have a program between Canada and Vermont called the Economics for the Anthropocene, which has been funding us for the last few six, five, six years. And I, I brought up the, the issue of we need to educate people on energy. If we want them to reduce their consumption, we need to find a way for them to understand what energy is and to do so in a way that is not technical, like super technical, because most people get lost. So the reason why I ended up in studying all these issues was because Charlie was able to teach us in the, the most easy to understand way when we were taking our energy systems class back in 2011. I took your class and then from that point on, I'm here doing a PhD on energy transitions in Vermont. Um, and I just wanted to ask you, what can we do to make sure that you know, we have social media now, we have, we have all kinds of means to be able to educate a population on that. And that, that's one of my questions and my other comment is, if you were invited to the US Congress by Bernie, who is the chair, the chair of the budget committee, and they're gonna pass the infrastructure bills. If you were asked to go to a hearing, what would you tell them to focus on in their, in their two to four trillion dollar investments they're going to be making in the next few months? Well, as I commented on briefly in my talk, and Rigo, it's nice to see you. Rigo is a really wonderful student uh, from years ago. Um, what I I don't know what to do because I don't think we support the data or the institutions that allow me, who knows, I suppose, as much about this as most people, to make these evaluations. Um, we, we don't have, we don't even, the Bureau of Census, that's the word I was trying to think of a while ago, the Bureau of Census doesn't maintain the records that we used to have back in the 1970s and 1980s that would allow us to make uh, good evaluations of the energy return on investment of US oil and gas. So um, we need much better data and objective data and, and we've got to stop using science to support a position. Um, and that's true even for our national scientists. Um, and so I don't know how to tell Bernie what to do if he asks me. And I'm a fan of Bernie, don't worry. Um, but if he asks me, um, I, I would say, well, let's build uh, wind turbines and, and solar PVs and let's uh, do a complete energy cost economy. Let me tell you what you got to do. You got to follow the dogs. This is developed in uh, Pieto and Hall. All kinds of people do solar PV analysis and, and they don't include all the costs. If, you, if there's a dollar cost, there's an energy cost. A dollar is a lean on energy. 
And so if you're using, spending money, you're spending energy, you better figure that out. Uh, can we make this transition? Uh, Capilano uh, Perez says, well, just barely. Um, well, we have to understand that much better. Um, I'm a scientist. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a policy guy. I, I don't know exactly what policy. Should we build nuclear and conventional nuclear or not? Can't tell you. I don't have the data. Okay. Um, should we? Uh, but I'll tell you one thing, and nobody taught, you're asking the wrong damn questions. How do we get the population to decline? And how do we get per capita affluence to decline? Those are the real questions. And nobody asked them. So I'm going to ask them right here. Bernie, those are the goddamn questions. <laughs> okay. And let's talk about the details. Like okay. whether you're going to build a wind turbine and Grandfather Mountain or not, like you did in 1942. Yeah. They come after you've asked the real questions. Okay. Reduce the load. Okay, Bill Reeves, you're up. And well, thank you. Bill yes. is, uh, or sorry, Bill Tyson is next. Thanks, Charlie. Really good to see you again. I've been a student of yours in the background for, I guess, 20 or 30 years now. And Listen, ev yeah, everybody here has... Uh, I suppose implicitly or explicitly in the last case, assume that there are solutions to this uh, crisis that we're in. And I think that your story really says there may not be a solution. There are problems that have no uh, solution, at least in the form that most people uh, think of a solution. You mentioned that we have economic models that don't fit the real world, but our entire global economy, the human enterprise, is based on those economic models. And I would suggest that techno-industrial society simply cannot fit in the ecosphere, which is a thermodynamic engine, uh, at all. There are no adjustments to the beliefs, values, and assumptions of our current society that can make it fit in the kind of world that actually exists in biophysical reality. I wonder if you have any comment. Let me, two other points. Anyone who's interested in human behavior has an obligation to themselves to read Barbara Tuchman's book, The March of Folly, which <laughs> illustrates how absolutely absent from political discourse is human intellect for the most part. And secondly, Joseph Tainter's book, The Collapse of Complex Societies, which shows how all of the symptoms that we're currently facing previously have been ignored by countless other societies, which led to their eventual implosion, either rapidly or, or not. At any rate, I think we're confronting here an insoluble problem. Do you have any comment on that? Uh, well, I, it, as I said, it was my sixth problem, Bill, is, is, <laughs> exactly. is, is human behavior. And in, in what are we doing? Um, you know, we're just doing what we've been designed to do, what our genes are designed to do, which is, is to get out there and screw and get as much stuff as we can. That's what our genes are all about. And it's no different from the genes of the animals in my backyard. If I move my head, there's a bear out there and uh, two cubs. And she's obviously been, been doing what she's been selected to do, which is to get pregnant and to go and eat our, my strawberries and so in the backyard. So um, the, uh, I would hope there's a solution because we, we have this incredible capacity to understand our world. And I'd like to go for a, a solution. And I personally had no children for these reasons and other reasons. And um, so it's quite possible the human behavior can be and I, you know, I really like girls, uh, love my wife, um, but um, I didn't have any children. And so we can change our behavior. Uh, if you see the problem and let's put it this simply, I, I read the limits to growth and decided not to have any children. Okay, so now, of course, I've led a, a modestly affluent uh, lifestyle, for sure, um, but, can we do this? It's not in our genes. We have to change. 
I'm an educator. That's basically my life has been in education. And what can we do? I don't know. I'm giving this talk. Does this talk work? I don't know. Show the talk to Bernie and let him, and he can talk to me. But um, in other people, Nate Hagen's does things on this other, you, you know, we start stuff on this. So, uh, but you know, we, we found fundamental flaws with the basic neoclassical economic model and published it back in 1984. And many times since then, in the very best terms and all of that. And they have completely ignored this. And no economic, and we have a book on biophysical economics, it should be, the basic economics textbook for the, the 1 million young people a year that take fairy tale economics every year in the United States. Why aren't we doing that? Why are we teaching this other crap? Well, talk to university administrators and you get nowhere. And so uh, I don't know what the solution is. And if we don't, I think it's very easy to come up with a technical solution, a medium medium. It's possible, certainly. But I think it's socially, and this is my sixth problem, it's socially impossible. Yeah. And so, at least as I understand it, so th I think we should work on that problem. Surely there are great minds out there that can resolve that problem. I can't. Okay, good, good stuff, uh, Charlie. Uh, Bill Tyson, you're up, and Solis, could you turn on your microphone, please? Yeah, okay, I just wanted to make a point about human nature. I, I think we're running out of time. We like to call ourselves homo sapiens, but we're like a bunch of lemmings running toward the cliff. And it, it's hard to be optimistic when you realize that 50% almost of a sophisticated, educated population like the US can vote for a man like Trump. If that is the case, what, what hope is there? Yeah. Yeah, uh, maybe they were no answer to that one. Right, thank you. In my talk on populism. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, okay, the uh, Solus, uh, uh, your question uh, down there in uh, bug free New Zealand. <laughs> Hello, Charlie, it's lovely to see Hi, you. Can Solis. you hear me? <laughs> Hi. Um, uh, I, I, there's a, there, it's it's great to have an update, and it's it's nice to see some of the more interesting stuff that you've been doing recently. My question is around: you're clearly getting more uh, EROI type literature across your desk. Do you see the networks building up through academia that might lead to you know a more um, a more open uh, embracing of these ideas? Uh. I don't know. Um, I mean, of course, I have some problems with some of the literature, and I'm asked to review stuff, and that's healthy, I think. And uh, I worry when you know when I'm gone and John Day is gone, and the rest of us people who came up with these ideas, uh, who's going to carry the torch? Um, but uh, maybe some. Well, Rigo, maybe uh, he's a great hopes, and a few others. But um, I do find it's getting a lot more coverage. And I have hope for our new uh, Biophysical Economics Institute. Um, and just look up on the web, www.bpeinstitute.org, I think. And uh, so I hope. One of the things we, what our objective is very simple, as it says in the uh, web pages, to bring science into economics and economic decision making. And the question is, at what scale can we do this? Uh, and, and that's something that maybe we don't know. But I view this possibly in other activities like the International Society of Biophysical Economics, similar name, but very different institutions. Um, and Jessica, who will be speaking next week, is the president of that. Um, and uh, I see that we will, 
I do have hope that we will be able to do an end run on economics. What I would like to see happen is that for people in the financial and industrial world um, to, who've been writing me because they are dissatisfied with conventional economics for making their investment decisions. They think that they are wasting their investors' money on things that are painted green but are not real green. And so we'd like to examine what is genuinely green. And so we're hoping that we can reach, a, a, we can do an end run in American football. An end run is everybody's in the middle uh, doing stuff and you've got the football and you run around and you end run. <laughs> so we hope we can do an end run on the economists who've been ignoring us for 50 years uh, and paying no attention to this with a few exceptions. So I don't know. It, it, <laughs> My basic thing is to get our textbook into the hands of undergraduates in all of our universities. Yeah. Give them at least that option to see that maybe what they're learning in their economics course is because it does, is not consistent with the laws of physics is a crock of shit. Yeah, and, and it's perhaps not to stop the distribution just at the students but these business people that are coming across your desk that they need to get a copy of it too yeah. okay so many of them have and they like it so thank far, you they like it a lot good stuff they want to spread it dave, dave doherty is, is up sorry i didn't give you any warning uh and roland could you please you're on deck could you please activate your mic? thanks so much no problem on the warning got that um, thanks very much for your talk. My question is, what is the evidence on whether those spending <coughs> said somewhere between three and five times the energy? Uh, are I'm not we, hearing you. There's some noise. Could you repeat? I will repeat. It's not, the noise is not from my end. Uh, okay, so the question is, what is the evidence on whether those who are spending, I think you said somewhere in the neighborhood of three to five times the energy, are leading better lives than those who have enough to meet their basic needs for food, water, shelter, and security? Um, this will be addressed explicitly by Jessica um, Lambert, who will talk next week. And so rather than answering your question, I, I hope you can tune in next week and uh, she will answer your question explicitly. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, good stuff. Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, Roland, uh, you're on. And Madeline, could you please turn on your microphone? Yeah, Charles, uh, thank you very much for your convincing uh, words about the importance of the EROI. Uh, I have to say that I was surprised with the emphasis that you have put on depletion rather than on climate change. Uh, is it right or wrong? Uh, to say that we have today enough or more than enough reserves of oil and gas and uh, that the problem is the quota of CO2. If we burn the reserves that we already know, and I'm not talking about unconventional or even carbon, that we would put extra CO2 in the atmosphere in a way that we would not respect the uh, Paris Agreement and that the temperature rise would be two, three, four, or five degrees. So it's not a problem of depletion. It's a problem of CO2 quota. Uh, well, the way I, don't forget, I put climate change as, or potential climate change, first as the problems we must deal with. But I didn't talk about it simply because everybody else does. And I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying it's one of the most important problems, but everybody else is talking about it. And we're not talking about what I consider to be an equal or, in my mind, greater problem of uh, depletion. But uh, I don't know which is the most important role. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, are you going to die from cancer or a heart attack? Well, I don't know. Um, you know, we all, is civilization going to collapse from one or the other, or is it not going to solve, collapse at all? I don't know. Uh, but I, since 
it's my business to know about energy because that's what I spent my life as a scientist trying to do. Uh, that's what I talk about. So I don't want to negate the importance of CO2. I want to import, negate the fact that nobody, that, that gets lots of press coverage and people worry about it and make decisions. Incidentally, many of the decision, decisions <coughs> that are made about CO2 are energetically very poor decisions. Um, and so we have to have a more balanced approach, I believe, in our teaching, in our press coverage, in our whatever. Okay. Good, good stuff. Thanks, Roland. Madeline, you're up. Uh, and Steve Kurtz, could you please turn on your microphone? Okay, well, the, just a, a brief comment in case people aren't discouraged enough. Um, yesterday, John Mayer was actually there as well. We attended a webinar hosted by the Globe and Mail, and the um, per, people giving it was the Century Initiative, which is an organization formed specifically to promote a Canada of 100 million people by 2100. Um, so they had a bunch of distinguished people there. Uh, the last speaker was Brian Mulrooney, but they had a panel with a, um, a panel discussion and they had a senator on there um, and they they had a Supreme Court, the former Supreme Court Justice um, Beverly McLaughlin was also on board with all this. Um, Mulroney, who, who finished the talk, he, he talked about he's, he strongly endorsed the objective of a Canada of 100 million to achieve Canadian greatness and went on and on about that. He wanted the Canadian government to he said, we have to have a strategy to do this. We can't just let it happen. Uh, he encouraged the government to form a white paper, which is what the Canadian government does if it has a problem and wants to solve in a group to study it, and then it produces a white paper. This would be discussed in parliament and you know, voted on and et cetera, et cetera. And then he said, you know, there's gonna be resistance because Canadians don't like change and this and that. But the point is this whole thing, and it seems to me that the Century, Century Initiatives project is the, the basis of the current Canadian government's immigration policy, which is insane this year. We wanna bring in 400,000 people. Um, so all of this good stuff, biophys totally divorced from biophysical reality as, as you've described it. This is what's running our societies. And it, it's, you know, it's totally discouraging to, in today's Globe and Mail, I don't get it, but um, the Globe and Mail is, you know, like a national newspaper based in, in Toronto. It, it had an, um, an op-ed by John Iveson, who was one of the hosts, and he's, uh, I think he's a, a writer there. Anyway, I'm, you know, saying the government should have a white paper on, on growing Canada's population on immigration. So what's to do? <laughs> I mean, I, I, that's well, just... the first thing I do is write in a letter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have done. I'm going to do that. I've actually succeeded and in the why, past. Why don't, while you're at it, why don't you uh, put a, a link to uh, the recording of this, pay, of this uh, uh, presentation? Would, would be a good idea. Yeah, yeah. I, I, know it, I know it'll fall on deaf ears, but I mean, I feel like that we're little teeny puny people fighting against the whatever. I mean, haven't, haven't you basically used up most of the oil in Alberta, the real oil? The, oh, yeah. The, the, the tar now yeah. you got to go after that crappy stuff. What, what are you, you going to run Canada on? Well, those are excellent questions. And I did, they did do a survey afterwards. And I, you know, I pointed out that they were completely divorced from any kind of reality, these expectations. But, but this is, you know, this is still how policies are made. Um, yeah, it, it emphasizes, Charlie, it just emphasizes why do society, societies fall apart? You get stratified society uh, and uh, the, the, they hire stratus who make their, uh, make the decisions and control things. Uh, they become divorced uh, from the uh, realities that actually built the, the country and uh, they can't change. So uh, if you're a, uh, a speculator, a developer, uh, media corporation, you need growth, you need high population growth to support you. And those are the people that are making the decisions. Uh, biophysics, not our environmental effect on uh, the population per capita income equality, not in the equation. And I, I think that's the issue. Now I'm talking over Charlie, but uh, anyway, uh, Matt, uh, can we go on to the next question or the- uh, No, I'm done, yeah. Have I, okay, all right, Steve Kurtz. Uh, you're up, and uh, John Day, please turn on your microphone. Well, I don't know how you got the impression that I 
wanted to ask a question, but it's very nice to have got to see and hear Charlie because uh, we've communicated cyberly for maybe five or six years or more. Steve is one of my regular critics. <laughs> uh, shall we say inter interlocutor? <laughs> okay. Uh, and it was good to see uh, Rob Hoffman, who I've known for 20 years, and Madeline, I've known for 20 years, and see the, you know, but, and John, nice to see your face because I've come across you in, in uh, email communications as well. Uh, I made a couple of comments on the chat and uh, I'm one of these people that believes free will is an illusion. And I believe that the maximum power principle, which Odom and Latka developed uh, applies to us as it does to all other life forms. So uh, I'm with Bill Reese and, and with Rob Hoffman that we're up against it. If, if, if there is a solution, I think it's accidental. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, John, John Day. Hi. Uh, yes. I, I, I'll just say first, I don't believe there's a solution period. If we're talking about maintaining the current global industrial society. And I just wanted to throw in a few facts that if we look at, uh, you know, how long it took to increase fossil fuel production to 2010 levels by an order of magnitude. So it took uh, for coal, natural gas and oil, it took anywhere from 110 to 55 years to increase an order of magnitude. And as we all know, fossil fuels come out of the ground essentially ready to use. We don't have to catch them in a solar collector and turn them into electricity. Uh, if we're going to replace by, and by 2050, a lot of people say, if we're gonna replace fossil fuels with uh, uh, renewables, then they would have to increase in by two orders of magnitude in 30 years. So that's a dramatic difference in the development of fossil fuel. And plus that, that allowed us two centuries almost to get used to fossil fuels and figure out how to use them. And second, there's a lot of hoopla in the, in the, you know, in the literature if you, about fusion power. Well, I looked online and the fusion power, uh, the thing that's being uh, built over in France right now is a 500 megawatt plant, 500 megawatt. Typical coal power plant is a thousand megawatts. 500 megawatt plant costs from 20 to $30 billion. And you know, the old thing about expensive boiling water, are they gonna produce hydrogen and stuff like that? But you've got things like that looking you in the face and, and this has got to happen really quickly. And I, and I believe that we've got to get off fossil fuels because if we don't, the climate thing is going to just bring us down. And finally, human behavior, people should read into uh, Robbie Berger and Jim Brown's ideas of what they call the MDD, the Malthusian Darwinian dynamic. And it's like Charlie said, it's in our genes. That's what we do. And, and everybody does it. You know, and, and it's wired. We're wired into that. And we've been doing the same thing over and over for thousands of years. Just maybe we're killing more people in a more sophisticated way these days, you know, with warfare and stuff. But anyway, that's that's uh, my comment. Okay. What do you think, Charlie? <laughs> uh, when have I ever disagreed with you? <laughs> Charlie and I were students together back in Chapel Hill 50 years ago. Okay. And we've written many, many, many papers together uh, in book and so forth. So, uh, uh, you know, it's a little bit unnerving. I, I was expecting some critical comments here. Uh, but so, I mean, I re realize that we're preaching to the converted but, uh, in, in the Mr. <laughs> Crow Society, but come on, doesn't anybody have a negative comment? Does anybody like to argue with any? Okay, I'll, I'll argue with you. You want an argument? We can argue. Okay. Uh, I have to take issue with uh, the uh, uh, the geothermal aspect. Uh, Art, as he pointed out, that was a big part of his uh, his energy strategy. And uh, when I looked at uh, Canada's situation, I see that as the biggest, uh, uh, most important thing we can do in this country in a northern climate uh, uh, to to go geothermal. Uh, you can get uh, uh, a a return. 
uh, uh, coefficient uh, efficient of performance on your high grade energy of up to 30 to one, not just four to one, if you store low grade energy. If you can gather heat during the summer, pump it down into the ground, uh, store the energy down there, get your thermal heat mass uh, up to maybe uh, 50 or 60 Celsius, you can run off that over the four months uh, in this country, five months when you're getting virtually no solar uh, and you can, you can run off that and get uh, a system uh, uh, return of about 30 to one. So that uh, for Northern climates, I think that's, that's a, a large positive. How energy. much does it cost? It, it's not that oh, expensive because we've already paid for the earth. You, uh, if you do geothermal boreholing, uh, it, it's vastly uh, uh, cheaper than uh, battery electric storage. I think I calculated about 0.05% uh, of the cost of uh, Tesla power walls. Uh, and it lasts a hell of a lot longer. Uh, and uh, the, uh, it's accessible. It's right under your feet. Uh, uh, well, go for it. Yeah, no, I'll send you uh, it. Uh, so there's potential there. The Swedes are doing a lot of it. And of course, Canada has only got a couple of places that do. It. Could I address yeah. one point there? Yeah. Uh, the, I agree with you. But the thing is, is you can't run agriculture off of uh, geothermal. You can't run massive worldwide transportation over geothermal. You yeah. can't run a lot of things. You can't run the industrial society. It's just that. That's why there's no solution. You could use that to keep people comfortable in, in certain ways and provide a certain amount of energy. But for all the stuff we do in an industrial society, that's not an answer. No, I, I agree. But you're taking a part of the load off and you're not excluding solar, uh, uh, solar heat. You still have the, the, the high quality. Uh, you can still generate as much high quality energy uh, but you don't need as much of it to keep yourself warm because you've got this other system, which is geothermal, which captures low grade energy from the sun at about 50% return uh, efficiency, pumps it down into the ground, and four months later, you can get 50% of that energy back. So it, it's, it's low cost, low grade energy, uh, and it is just one aspect, one, one, one point. So that's, you're looking for an argument, there you go. I think you want an argument in bits at a time. There's no one uh, tech that solution that's going to solve them all, but there are many which taken together take a great deal of the load off. And one other point, uh, places that are very heavily dependent now on hydro like Canada uh, have a far better chance of offloading than the people I'm working with in small island developing states where they've got solar, but not much else. And they're bringing the oil in over the reef. And so in a sense, if you're doing transportation technology, you're gonna fill the batteries in a place where it's coming off of renewable energy. And you're gonna be able to take a lot of that energy around, but it's gonna to have to be done a little bit at a time. Okay. Um, I think, the, Todd, I think that, that that's good. And I think there are many things we can do to meet the necessities of life. Uh, but I think one thing we should understand, if you look at the, the graphs of the United States or of the world, that we're not displacing fossil fuels with the renewables. We're adding to them. Um, <laughs> And so the CO2 continues at the same level, which is very high. Um, but what we're doing then is we're adding some additional energy to that in the form of solar of various sorts. Um, but, you know, I, I, I agree with you, Ted, that I think there are many things that you can do depending upon where you are and so forth. You've got solar or apparently wherever you are uh, probably john day doesn't need to pump heat in the ground in louisiana um, for his winter <laughs> and um but it sounds like it might be good for canada well these are the kind of discussions we should be having i mean what yeah. works where and uh to do what sort of thing 
Hey, Charlie, uh, you're, you're very correct that it's a behavioral challenge uh, because we already know that a lot of the technologies that people have been talking about may even be, quote, economic, not, not, only, not only desirable, but making people alter their metrics and alter their behaviors, I think, is a far bigger challenge than most of the, uh, the technological ones that we're seemingly reasonably able to take on. Okay, uh, if uh, we have to look at ending the recording, but can I, I see there's one more question from Jeb uh, uh, Torsheimer. Uh, the uh, Jeb, if you'd like to ask your question, uh, maybe we can uh, wrap it up after that. Jeb, still here? No? Maybe not. Okay, Art, what do you think we should do? Oh. I think we should uh, uh, stop the recording and, and uh, ha have a free-for-all discussion after that. You want to okay. thank the, the speaker? Okay, uh, Charlie, thanks. This has been great and uh, really appreciate it. And I, I think what you've done is revitalize the question. Uh, and and I, I think we can go from here, but I, it just seems to me everybody seems to view mm -hmm. the, the issue uh, you know, and uh, uh, from maybe the same or view that there are huge issues and the uh, biophysical economics is maybe the path to eliminate uh, some uh, useful uh, uh, progress. If, if we can make any, it'll be along that path, I think. So thanks very much, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie.